There's actually a lot of VC money, tons of cash sitting on the sidelines. That money is not going to be given back. That money is going to be spent. Here's the thing that I don't think about, which is our ownership. Sometimes we're paying a big price and we're paying a big price because it's an incredible team and an incredible opportunity. If someone makes you an offer you can't refuse, don't refuse it. Take it. Ready to go? Kevin, I'm so excited for this. Listen, I've heard so many good things from so many people. So thank you so much for joining me first off. No, very excited to be here. Now, I know it's a weird question, but I just think we're so shaped by our early years in a lot of cases. When you think back to growing up, how would your parents and teachers have described the young Kevin Ryan? You know, in some ways, I haven't actually either progressed or changed that much from high school. So, you know, in high school... I was interested in, um, I was running student organizations. I was head of the student council. Uh, I did a lot of sports. I was very interested in public policy. And frankly, today, those are still a lot of my interests. You know, I have always been a CEO from a very early age. I was president of my fifth grade class and my sixth grade class. Um, so, you know, people wanted, thought I, I should be elected to do these things. And I love doing them. I love managing people. I love working with people. Uh, I'm still very interested in, in sports and athletics uh, and in very interested in public policy. Okay, so we both are in the people selection business. I have this weird thesis that the best people always show early signs of exceptionalism. No one comes out of McKinsey at 28 and suddenly becomes exceptional. They show it in their early years. Do you agree with that? And do you think that the best do show early signs of exceptionalism always? So we have to define exceptionalism and we have to think about also not just the job. I think people make a mistake in only looking at the extreme. So you're like, oh, Mark Zuckerberg at age 19, you know, dropped out of Harvard, was entrepreneurial. You know, the vast majority of successful CEOs of, of companies are people who, you know, went to good colleges, did well, exceptional, exceptional in that way, may have done two years at McKinsey. Um, but were truly interested. They weren't necessarily crazy entrepreneurial. I'll give you an example. I was the first investor in Walla, which is a mobile bank in Argentina. Yeah. And there's a guy named Pier Paolo Barbieri. It's a, people thought a bank in Argentina is an insane idea. This is six, seven years ago. It's currently worth about $2 billion. I've been on the board since beginning. He is, you know, was Phi Beta Kappa at Harvard, did work at McKinsey, was truly exceptional. And then now is managing 1,500 people. I, I wouldn't use the McKinsey example that you use. I would say that no one just, you know, is a surfer for five years. And then at 26, all of a sudden launches a billion dollar company. That doesn't happen as much. They, they show drive and focus and success before. No, I, I totally agree. And actually, I, I didn't. Yeah, I, I love Pier Paolo. I think he's fantastic. And so that's incredible to hear. How do you think about the difference between luck versus skill? People often talk about it on the show, and I'm never quite sure where to weigh it. How do you think about that? It, look, it definitely plays a role, you know, because there are things that are out of your control. And the reason you know that's true is that, you know, if you have people like me who've started 20 companies, no one has 20 successes. They may have more successes than your average person, but, you know, it's, it's not a perfect process, you know? Uh, and so there's some things out of your control, some things in the industry. If you remember a long time ago, I started a company called Gilt and Gilt after four years was doing $500 million in revenue. So crazy success. We did $175 million in revenue in our second year, which I don't think anyone in New York City has ever done. So you'd say, oh God, you're killing it. What happened? Then everyone in the industry started discounting their merchandise online. So Mark Jacobs started selling discounted merchandise on their site. Macy's did, Farfetch did, everyone did. It became very difficult out of our control to make money. And so it ended up being less successful than you would have thought. And I didn't like the industry dynamics and so sold the company. Did that hurt? Yeah. Yeah, because after four years, we were worth a billion dollars and... At the time, you know, everyone invested at a billion because they thought it was going to be worth two to three billion. And we ended up selling it for $250 million, despite having an incredible product, an incredible culture, uh, fantastic people. I'm, you know, I've funded many people who came out of there. Zola is all ex guilt people. Security Scorecard is my ex uh, head of security, you know, almost worth a billion dollars. Uh, so many good things came out of it, but it 
it definitely hurt. I put a lot of work into that and got less than I thought. Kevin, bit of a weird one, but when I go across your career, there's so many incredible companies. I know it's hard. What do you consider your biggest success? Unfortunately, there's a couple different dimensions. The, the monetary uh, answer is Mongo by far. You know, Mongo's worth $25 billion. There's only two companies started in the last 30 years in New York that are worth $25 billion. So that is a you know big, big success. And still growing, and I think we'll be a $50 billion company someday. You know, DoubleThink was the most impactful for me. I was 32. I had never managed more than 40 people. You know, four years after the beginning, I was managing 2,000 people in 25 countries. We went public 20, 24 months after we started. We did 10 acquisitions during that time. I learned a tremendous amount and had an incredible experience. So that was the most impactful in setting up my entire career. Actually, Business Insider was probably the product I enjoyed the most because I just love business news. I love media. And I love that challenge of, you know, if I said to you, uh, I'll give you a million dollars. You have two people. I want you to start a media company. You can never advertise. Okay? You can never spend $1 on advertising. I'd, but my, ideally, you'll end up with 300 million uniques uh, go. I think you'd say, that's awfully hard. And that's exactly what we did. And so... Uh, that was very fulfilling. And then the final answer is guilt was the most fun because I didn't know anything about fashion. And all of a sudden, my wife can't believe that three years later, I'm in the front row of the fashion shows in Milan, seeming like a super cool person when I'm really not. On the business side, what was one or two of the biggest business lessons? So this doesn't apply to every company, but we moved faster than everyone else. And so we started at the same time as some other people, but we were able to raise more money. People believed in what we were doing. We spent the money. We took the chance. But to open 25 off, uh, offices in 25 countries before your first country is profitable, in retrospect, is a bold move. Now, what was the result of that? If you were uh, Procter & Gamble or Microsoft and you have operations in 50 countries, we had at least had offices in your 25 biggest countries and my competitor was only in six who are you going to work with? You're going to work with us. The reason today, which is literally more than 25 years later, that DoubleClick, which is part of Google, dominates the world in ad technology is because we won the battle of the first five years by moving faster, more aggressively, took chances, made some mistakes, and have never given up that position ever since. How do you think about the importance of first to market? Everyone often talks about it, but then some alternatively suggest you learn from the first to market and can out-execute them being second. How do you think about that today being an investor? It's true that sometimes the, uh, the early bird gets the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. <laughs> uh, so that, that can happen. Unfortunately, you never know. There are many, many examples where the first player who moves very quickly and gets critical mass uh, is the winner. Now, you have to see, is that a business where it matters? So in, in things like Uber, being five times bigger than Lyft ultimately does make the difference. And so it was worth it for them to just go, we're going to be number one or we're going to die. In other businesses, though, that's not true. You know, uh, it, you don't have to be scale isn't quite as important. Quality is important. And also, you have to adjust all of this to the capital available. It's all fine and good when people will give you a billion dollars. You know, Mongo, we lost a billion dollars before we had a profitable quarter over 10 years. And so that's, you know, a scary number, a scary okay, number. Could, could, could Mongo have existed in a down period? Because I guess it really lived in that bull period. Yes, from it did. 2000, yeah. Um, it would have existed and we would not have been able to invest as much and not been able to grow as much. Today, I don't know that many companies outside of AI that uh, where people will give you a billion dollars to lose. But today, you know, that exists in AI. It doesn't exist in a lot of other areas. So I, I so many different areas. I want to this. <laughs> you mentioned like financing availabilities. Yeah. You went through the dot com with double click. Yeah. And I look old, Kevin, but I'm rather useful, <laughs> I must admit. I, I don't remember this as a professional. How was that? And what were some business lessons for you from that that you took with you? When two years ago, people were, you know, complaining about it's hard to get money and things like that. I really felt like your, your grandfather talking about the depression where like you just don't understand we had no food in the depression because in 2001 2002 
there was just no money. And when I mean no money, no money. And so there were companies that went under that shouldn't have. Uh, everyone pulled back. You know, in two years ago or last year, you know, things were tighter, but the vast majority of our companies raised rounds. It was okay. Uh, so yeah, it was brutal. We did, by the way, we did seven rounds of layoffs. We went from 2,000 people back down to 1,000 uh, doing layoff after layoff. 70% of our clients went bankrupt. If anyone's taking notes, don't do that. Uh, it's not helpful for your business. What, the seven layoffs? No, the 70% of your clients going under. Or the seven layoffs. No, Se like, that that also, always... that's, but that, you have to do that when 70% of your clients go away. And they don't even pay the last bill as well. So you eat, you know, tens and tens of millions of dollars of revenue you thought you had and then have to write off. Do you not think we're going to get worse from here? I do. I mean, right now the economy is very good. I think that there's, if we look over 30 years, uh, on average, if the stock market's at an all-time high and unemployment is at an all-time low, if you said, are the odds that things are going to get better or worse, by definition, there's a reversion to the mean at some point. I don't plan for that. Things right now look uh, pretty good, pretty stable. There's another characteristic in our business is there's actually a lot of VC money. You know, there's tons of cash sitting on the sidelines. That money is not going to be given back. That money is going to be spent. We're only debating whether people are going to spend it over two and a half years, which they were doing four years ago, or over five years, which they're probably going to do now. But there's a lot of money out there that is going to keep this industry going. And the second thing that independent of any macro factors you're talking about or thinking about, you know, most things happen at a micro level. So you know, we started a company in assisted fertility. Assisted fertility is going to grow. I can guarantee you that 10 years from now, more women will have egg freezing, more women will be doing IVF than they do it today. That's just going to grow regardless of the economy. And so there's a lot of things like that that are going to happen and are going to be fine. I, listen, I'm so glad you said that. One thing that I'm always nervous to take as an investor is market timing risk. I don't think that I'm smart enough to predict markets uh, in terms of the timing and consumer adoption. How do you think about market timing risk? I'll tell you why I don't. First of all, we're doing very early stage work. So, you know, the bet we are making is that, uh, and, and when we have a, an offsite, we we think about, we put up the, the number 2034, 10 years from now. So all the conversations we're having are about trends that we believe are 10 year trends. And the reason is I know that unfortunately you have to assume it takes 10 years to build a really successful company. Sure. And I can almost guarantee you that there's going to be recession during that time. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea when it's going to be, you know, could be next year, could be five years from now. It's just part of life. It's like saying, you know, I don't know if you go sailing, I'm not a sailor, you go sailing for a month. Yeah, you're going to have bad weather. Yeah, you're going to have bad weather at some point. You know, if you, if you can't deal with that, don't sail. So that's, I don't worry about that. What I worry about is, you know, we're big investors, for example, in the psychedelic industry. Is the psychedelic industry going to be 20 times larger 10 years from now than today? Absolutely. We have to create the right products, navigate our way and get there. Uh, but if I get that assumption right, which sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, you have a much, much better chance of having success. Are you a market-led investor or a people-led investor? It's just interesting when you said there about that. I do the complete opposite because I'm like, I have no freaking idea which markets are going to be big in 2034. It's the job of the founder to show me the future. And my job is to select great people. Are you a market-led investor or a people-led investor? They're both really important. And if I said to you, if someone comes to you tomorrow and says they're going to start a new department store selling clothes online... I don't care how good that person is, it's not going to work. Not a single one of those has worked in 10 years. Um, so the market is, is a factor. Yeah. Question for you. Do you not often get it, though, where amazing people choose not great ideas? Yes. And the thesis is that they will pivot to something adjacent that works. No, because, yeah, there are examples where that happens. And you assume a good founder will do that. But if you are going into an industry that ends up just not happening, you know, you can't pivot and you won't be able to get the money to do that. If you're going to pivot into something that's slightly different, that's okay. But you're not going to start a lab-grown meat company and then decide to go to solar energy. That's just not going to happen. So you just got the industry right or wrong, and that will happen. E-commerce, there's been probably net, you know, no value created in five years. 
Same with media. Uh, you know, with the exception of actually podcasts, hardly anything has worked in the last five years in media. So that's why it's not as simple to say just back good people. Um, you're looking for a combination of a very good person and a thesis that you believe in, ideally a sector growing or an opportunity to create a better product. How do you prevent past mistakes or challenging markets? How do you prevent them from impacting future decision making? So like, for instance, I hate ed tech. Yeah. It's a freaking hard market. Respectfully, I hate media. It's so freaking hard to make money yeah. in media. But I could be wrong, Kevin. Yeah. That could be something great. How do you prevent past impacting future? I'm not sure that we do or I do or anyone does. And I see it all the time when we have a company going out and we approach 10 VCs. And three of them will say, I invested in this sector eight years ago and I lost all my money. I'm out. Hmm. And they haven't even read the deck yet. And, but I'm not saying I don't do that as well. I mean, when I've had a bad experience, I think it sometimes does influence my thinking. I try intellectually to not let it happen. And I think I let it happen. So. Do you know which companies will get funded fast and well when they go out? I'm just intrigued. Is it the ones you think or is it actually a wide dispersion? You have a sense of two things ahead of time. One, you know whatever fundamental numbers, how they're doing, which that helps. I mean, you know, I don't have any companies going out that have quadrupled the revenues in the last year that don't get funded. The second thing you know is you can have a sense of how your CEO does in fundraising. Because there are, you know, I've had examples of CEOs who are incredible CEOs, great managers, visionary, but just don't present that well are disconfident and you know are worse at fundraising than they are at running the business. And they'll they get penalized often in the market for that, especially in the beginning when it's less about numbers and more about the vision. So those two things you know, and then sometimes you're you're surprised. I mean, I have one example of a company that just couldn't raise money and I, I thought it was gonna be uh easier for them than than it turned out to be. Do you think the best CEOs are the best fundraisers? Generally yes, because if you if you can raise a lot of money, it increases your odds of doing well dramatically and allows you to make some mistakes. In the long run, people will figure out if you're, you know, every round that goes along, it's more about the business and a little bit less about the CEO. Because obviously, if one guy shows up right now with a PowerPoint, there's just a person in a PowerPoint. So I'm really, you know, that's it. If we're in the around B, we're, the investor's looking at, you know, the, unit economics, uh, turnover, churn. There's a lot of things that are going to help that, that fundraise. When we think about that early founder analysis, do you prefer a founder who's an insider to a business, someone who's worked in that industry for years and is approaching it with relatively large levels of domain expertise? Or do you prefer the naive outsider who's approaching with a fresh perspective? It's going to be a little more in the middle there. So uh, I would say that a lot of the people we back are first-time founders. We would never, almost never back someone who comes from Procter & Gamble, a large company, and seems like a smart person, but they don't know startups. I once looked through the top 100 uh, consumer internet companies, and the one pattern was that most of the people who were very successful had actually not come from that vertical, but they had come from another startup. And in the same way that uh, Henry and I had not been in media, thought we could do media different. When I went out to ask people at the Wall Street Journal about my idea, they all said it was a terrible idea because they were too close to it. And so, you know, the guys from Airbnb, did they come from the hotel industry? No, they didn't. They came from outside and as a consumer thought, hey, why can't we do it better? Did the guys from, you know, Uber come from the taxi industry? No. So many, many, many examples, the vast majority of examples in the consumer space. I will tell you that in the B2B space, there aren't that many people that come into enterprise software and weren't in enterprise software. So it's a little bit harder there. And actually, when we started Mongo, the reason we had trouble uh, raising money, even though we had already had a very successful company, was because people said, you've never done a database before. You have, you, three of you have ad tech backgrounds. It's not the same thing. You've never done true enterprise software that you, you know, sold to a bank, we're not going to back you. I loved having Dev on the show, by the way. He's a fantastic person. I, oh. I remember he said something to me that really stuck with me. He said that good news travels incredibly fast and bad news travels incredibly slow. And as a leader, you must always remember that. Yes. I thought it was very insightful. No, Dave's, Dave's done a great job at Mongo. 
um, you know, when he took over, uh, we had 50 to $100 million in revenue. And today there's $2 billion in revenue. It's just enormous. It's scale. And he has really scaled. You mentioned the difference between consumer and enterprise there. Sorry, my mind jumps around, but it's a Friday. So just yeah. roll with it, Kevin. You know? I mean, like, uh, I'm not uh, focused. Oh, great. Uh, so I always say now, um, you know, I was in uh, quite a few of the consumer breakouts and they led to precisely fuck all returns, but, you know, good brands at the time. And I laugh and I say to my LPs now, I learned something, which is consumer is fun, but enterprise makes money. Yeah. We haven't seen anything really great in consumer in the last five years. Do you think that will change in the next five years? Or do you think incumbent advantage is so embedded now that enterprise is just where we make money? I think it's less about incumbent advantage than it is that it's just an extraordinarily mature business. So unless there is a step function, you know, where consumer businesses came in was an all of a sudden mobile came and Uber made sense. You know, when the internet came, that made sense. Uh, we may have, well, we're going to have some consumer businesses in AI. We don't know five years from now if Google is going to be the number one search engine. Uh, there's a chance that's a disruptive technology that allows it to change. So uh, I just think that media and, uh, and e-commerce are both sexy and accessible industries. So 50,000 entrepreneurs have gone after them. And so the, the next guy right now just probably isn't going to come up with a good idea. Whereas in the B2B that you're talking about, there are some things that have changed fundamentally either because they're science driven, you know, there are breakthroughs in regulation or in science that are allowing, allowing, I don't know, gene editing or psychedelics or something else. And so that's different than just another consumer application. The thing that worries me with AI, honestly, Kevin, is I just think that so much of the advantages accrue to the distribution that incumbents have and a better product does not lead to a winning product. And I think Google will bake in so many features that existing application layer startups are building that they just slowly get eroded over time. So I completely agree. And I, but I'd use the example, a better example for me is that's at the consumer level is more like Salesforce. So we've seen 20 companies saying we're going to build a new product that uses AI that allows you to contact your sales, sales, uh, your, your potential contacts. But the, the truth is that Salesforce is going to incorporate that in mm -hmm. and you know, a large company with a thousand person sales force is not going to easily switch off to a startup company. And so I have confidence that Salesforce will incorporate AI into their product. Maybe it's six months late, maybe it's a year late, but they're going to do it. And the switching costs are so high. And that's true of the pharma industry. That's true of the banking industry. That's true of everything. So I, I agree with that. Yeah. That, that, that's my, so it, it actually goes to one thing that I actually always like. I love huge markets with no competition. I love it how many founders go off to Stripe or Shopify. And I'm yeah. always like, really? You chose Toby Lutra <laughs> and the Collisons as the weak founders? That's an interesting <laughs> assessment. Yeah. Do you agree with me or do you go, I like competition. It shows a big market. Look, you, you want a big market. You'd like to have as little competition as possible. Um, it's very hard to find that. You know, Pier Paulo starting a mobile bank in Argentina. Guess what? We didn't have as much competition, but there was geopolitical risk you know, all kinds of risks. And he's been remarkably successful, but that's why it's going to be a $10 billion company because he went after a big market and there wasn't a lot of competition. Has your investing style changed over the years, Kevin? I'm not sure it's changed dramatically. The one thing I've changed, you know, when I was had a small team, we weren't industry focused. So now that we have a 24 person team, I am a big believer in having more industry focus. So, for example, we have you know, five or six full-time people in healthcare. And so we're really seeing everything. We have relationships with payers. We have relationships with hospitals. There's a whole bunch of things that make us a more valuable investor. In, in 2021, we did not focus on robotics. And uh, we saw probably 20 robotics deals just randomly. Then I brought on a now a two-person full-time team on robotics. They have visited... Stanford and MIT and Georgia Tech and Carnegie Mellon, been to robotics conferences. We saw a thousand robotics deals last year. That makes you a better investor. When, when, if I show you the fifth company that is making salads, you, that just makes you a better investor than seeing one and having to figure out how it works. What is the salad industry like? It, it puts you up to speed. So seeing everything is helpful. Do you think investors add value? You mentioned there about being a more valuable investor. I just had Trey on from Founders Fund who was like, 
investors don't add value. How do you think about that? So um, having been on both sides of that, you know, easily 90% of the value of a company comes from the CEO and uh, the team. Now, Having said that, making sure you have the right CEO, which is the board slash investor's responsibility, is the single biggest decision. I mean, you know, if you said, why is Mongo a very successful company? You could say, well, because Dave's been running it for the last seven years. I let the previous CEO go and hire Dave because we're getting to a new phase and the, and the, and the board as well. And I think that single decision you know, was extremely important and well executed, even though Dave has done obviously 99% of the work. Um, the other thing I would say is in the, the early stages of uh, a company, the investors play a much bigger role. So, you know, we've had companies that, uh, when, you know, we start so many companies, we're early stage. Uh, often you have a, a CEO that has literally never raised money before. So when we get them in front of 50, you know, venture capital firms, that is adding value. When they are hiring a CFO uh, for the first time because they were head of business development. They never actually managed a CFO before. Having a perspective on that is important. The other thing I would say, I had incredible investors at DoubleClick, uh, Bain and Greylock, for example. I had just remarkable partners. When you are CEO, you are too close to the business. That is your job. And so some distance is often helpful because they would come to a board meeting and you know they've worked with 20 CFOs or seen 20 sales plans. And so they just had a slightly better perspective. And once in a while, I'll be like, you know, that's a good point. I had not factored that in. I was too close to it. Um, but my point remains, 90% of it is having the right CEO and the right team. So I love serial entrepreneurs for the reason that you don't need to teach them how to fundraise. You don't need to teach them how to hire a head of sales. They've done most of it before and they've fucked up before as well, which means they should have learned the lessons last time. Now, they'll make new mistakes, of course, but they won't make some pretty obvious ones. How do you feel about that? You said earlier, we like to back first time founders. Am I wrong in terms of my thesis on serial entrepreneurs and that heavy preference there? And how do you think about that? Yeah. So in, again, if we look back at consumer businesses, you know, out of the top 25 companies, how many were serial entrepreneurs? Almost zero. Two? Almost zero. Yeah. You know, so you, the energy level of someone working 80 hours a week, feeling slightly nervous that they don't know how to do the job, you know, listening to other people because they've never done it before. There's a lot of value in that. By the way, you'll see an enterprise software, more of a pattern of repeat entrepreneurs, also on average, slightly older. You know, you don't, 24 year olds have trouble starting a database company and building up an enterprise sales force, meeting with the CEO of, of or the CTO of Goldman Sachs to close that deal. It really doesn't happen that often. Yeah. So industries are different. It depends whether the industry knowledge, experience, and credibility is extremely important to success. And in consumer, it isn't. Because I just go look at your app and I like it. I don't really care whether you're 10 years old or 50 years old. What do you think is the biggest determination of whether a company gets product market fit from zero to one? Everyone always says speed is the single biggest determinator or determining factor. Do you agree with that? No, no, I don't think that speed is the most important thing. You do need to get out your product, you know, pretty quickly, but it has to be pretty good. I mean, if it's terrible, we'll never hear from you again. It needs to be good enough that some people are using it. It's starting to grow. You're getting feedback and you're going to make it much better. Um, by the way, you know, it, it depends on the product. You know, if you use a database and it's, it's doesn't function and you lose all your revenues, then we're in a lot of trouble. That's a much more mission critical product. And so it just can't be terrible. So for example, we had no revenues after three years at Mongo, which is not great because we had to go slower. It had to work, it had to scale, it had to be secure. Whereas for consumer apps, it can be, you can, you can make mistakes. Did you question whether it would work? Three years in, no revenues. I, I can't remember how many years you said earlier, but you know, nine or 10 years in, no profits. So nine years in, yeah, I knew it was working. There was no problem. Three years in, we were nervous because uh, we just we couldn't charge for it yet. It was getting better and better. We knew the industry is very big. We knew there was an opportunity. We knew Oracle was too expensive and 
We knew that a non-relational database was a good idea, but you know, you can also just run out of money at some point. We didn't have incredibly successful fundraises during that time. Uh, but what you could see is that if I showed you one chart, which is how many people are downloading the Mongo database, that was just a straight line going up to the right all over the world. And as long as that kept happening, we thought we were on to something. Do you agree that companies die more often of indigestion and starvation? I hear it often, Kevin, and I think it's bullshit. I'm like, do you know how many companies die because they run out of cash? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, like... By definition, companies only die because they run out of cash. The question is, why do they run out of cash? They run out of cash because... Sorry, we have an alarm going off here. I don't know if you heard that, but... Don't worry. It's the companies running out of cash. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> They're like um, pulling the pull cord. <laughs> yeah. So... Um, why do they run out of cash? Because they don't have product market fit, uh, because investors are looking at the numbers, looking at the team and saying, I'm not going to put money in here. It's a tough one. It happens. I do want to discuss the new fund, speaking of investors and putting money in. So can you share the news with us that I think came out yesterday? So let's start there. Sure. Yeah, no, we've uh, first time, you know, we've been investing uh, really my money in a, in a different structure for the last decade. And, you know, we have uh, 120 companies in the portfolio, uh, have made many investments, started over 20 companies. But we just announced that we, it's the first outside fund with outside investors. So we've raised a $250 million fund to continue doing what we're doing uh, and continue to both start companies and invest in companies, largely on the East Coast in New York, but not only heavily healthcare, heavily tech, robotics, and social impact. So super excited. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a great time. Okay. How do you do resource allocation between incubations versus investments? So what I like is being industry focused. So the team in healthcare is doing both. And they, they, I'll give you a good example. We looked, decided to look at a vertical because we're doing deep research all the time. We're much more research driven than other firms. A person on our team started being interested in the shipping industry. So shipping industry is an enormous industry that needs a lot more technology. So she spends two months, interviews 50 people in that industry. What does she come away with? One, a new idea because realizes that there's a, a lack of a procurement marketplace. And so we started a company in that space uh, called Port Shop. And because she was at multiple shipping conferences, which most of us have not been at, she ran across a company that people were saying great things about called Box Hub, which is a marketplace for containers based in Toronto, which we never would have known about. And we invested in that as well. So it stems from if you know the industry and know the players and know the opportunities and know the holes, you both can start companies and invest in companies. My worry with incubations, and uh, tell me I'm wrong, the best founders won't want to be like a hired gun CEO to an idea that they're brought in on. How do you respond to my concern there? Well, let's not forget the data, which is that, you know, Business Insider was one of the most successful media companies ever started. MongoDB, one of the most successful databases companies ever started. Exactly another formula you just said can't work, where we started it and brought in a CEO. The question is, are you bringing in a great quality CEO? And the answer is yes. Uh, and then are you uh, incenting them correctly and making sure that it works? So we've never had a CEO resign. My psychedelic company, I think, is one of the most valuable psychedelic companies started in the last four years in the United States, Transcend. So many, I mean, Guilt was a big success. These are all examples where we have done that very, very successfully. Kevin, why do so many incubators fail where you've succeeded? So one, in some cases, they've tried to do too many companies and just tried to crank it out. Second is a level of execution. You know, you've got to have money and expertise and credibility. You know, that CEO who comes in is going to be sitting there thinking, yeah, I could maybe start my own company. One, I have to love this idea. Two, I have to feel like you've done a lot of research and are way up to speed. Three, I've got to feel like you're going to add value. And so hopefully some of these people are like, you know what, Kevin and the team have a lot of experience, have had a lot of success, can help me and increase the odds of, of my uh, company working. The vast majority of companies that people start don't work. Our hit ratio is much higher than your average entrepreneurs. And so, uh, and we give people plenty of equity so that they are incented. Um, and so, but it's still not easy. I mean, we don't have a hundred percent success rate. 
So to, on the too many, how many do you like to do them? What's the right amount for you? So it's bottoms up, but we historically, last couple of years, we're doing somewhere between six and eight companies a year. But we have multiple industry groups and multiple people. So at any one time, people here, one person can be working on one idea or one research project. Okay. How do you do resource allocation between new projects? And you have to be efficient with financing, cut it, inject more when there's milestones hit. How do you think about efficient resource allocation between those projects? Look, that's just a judgment call because you're, you know, looking at very different ideas. So, you know, sometimes we do, we just did two or three months on a fintech idea and just didn't get conviction. And so, you know, we're not going to do it, but that's a judgment call at the end of the day. I mean, look, how do you, it's like asking as a uh, entrepreneur, how do you have conviction to do this? You just get to the point where you're like, I know this is going to work. And I want to devote the next five years of my life to doing this. And sometimes you get it right. And sometimes you don't. Do you think you pull the ripcord soon enough on the ones you do quit? When we start a company, we don't bail out on the company, but we put a million, million and a half dollars in. We hire a CEO if we've made the decision to go forward. Now, then the market decides because nine months later, they're going to go out to raise money. And I would say four out of five times they go out and successfully raise around that someone has an outside lead investor. And once in a while, the market's like, no, we hate your company or we hate your CEO and we're not going to invest. So that's what determines it. Has that ever happened? And you've gone, I disagree with the market. I'm going to keep putting money in. Yeah, once um, I can think of one time where what we'll do sometimes is do a bridge round and we'll say, you know, we just need six more months because we'll have a uh, launch, we'll have customers, things like that. And so we have more confidence in the market. And then sometimes there we were right. And then sometimes there we were wrong. Kevin, can I be blunt? And please do forgive me if it's too personal. <laughs> How much have you invested before this structure of your own? To, yeah, this about, is a lot of it. Yeah, $250 million. Have you told your wife? <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. You, the guilt group got you a lot of bonus points, dude. You're fine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, look, I, you know, I've devoted my career to this sector. And so, you know, the, our returns have been, been extraordinary. Uh, things have worked. Uh, things are good. And this is incredible. There's nothing more fun in life than going after a new area. Psychedelics being an example. Super interesting. Ahead of the curve starting companies, investing in companies, and then and seeing it work. And, uh, and I've done that for a long time and really, really enjoy it. How do the deal structures that you mentioned a million and a half that is there a standard deal structure or does it depend on a per company basis? It depends, but you know, roughly the, the team and CEO are probably going to get around 40, 45% of the company. And then we will have the rest because we came up with the idea, put in the money, did all the work uh, and everyone gets paid from day one. So in order of magnitude, it's going to be that. Why do you invest as well? And what I mean by that is like your ownership when you invest like on a good day, it's like 50. I'm, I'm guessing here, but like for any investors, 15 would be good. Like when you have 50 or 60 in the incubations, is it an efficient use of capital to be an investor? It is because one, as I said earlier, the, the time you spend learning an industry gives you an advantage in investing. Secondly, you actually can't invest that much money in incubations. If you and I start a company tomorrow and we build a seven person team to build this, I mean, that's a million and a half dollars. So, and I don't have enough ideas. I wouldn't be able to come up with 30 ideas a year. So you've already done the work in a sector. You find out about incredible opportunities. You're seeing deal flow. I mean, is a year long enough? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but if you think about bringing a team together, maybe take three months to hire people, three months to ramp them. Gosh, that's six months of execution. That's not very much. Yeah. And then at that point, depending on the company, often we're able to raise money outside, but um, often we put in another million and buy ourselves another six months or nine months. You know, ideally the product is out. Some companies are using it. You can sense that it works. You've got a sense for pricing. Now we're just going to debate how big an opportunity is it. Tell me, how do you think about price? I'm intrigued. You've invested in like so many businesses yeah. now. Peter Fenton once said to me, price is a mental trap. <laughs> how do you think about price and your own price sensitivity? Here's the thing that I don't think about, which is our ownership. Meaning, you know, 
if you were going to buy a piece of an apartment and you said, I really want to own 10% of this apartment, uh, does that mean, and you have a certain amount of money, that means you're just never going to buy a really good apartment because the price is higher. So if I see three startups that just started six months ago, one of them has an incredible team going after an incredible market, that company is worth more than the other ones. And if I put a million dollars in, I'm going to get less of that company. But that doesn't mean it's a worse investment. At the end of the day, you're just trying to figure out, is this going to work or not? And you know, sometimes we're paying a big price uh, and we're paying a big price because it's an incredible team and an incredible opportunity. I get you. I also worry about dilution. I've had quite a few investments which ended up being amazing, but because of the capital that went in, you got like yeah. a three or a four X and you're like, Phew. no, but that's just another factor. You should factor in how much dilution you're going to take. What are the gross margins going to be? Um, so that, you know, super capital intensive businesses are going to be worse investments than ones that take very little capital. But on the other hand, if you do present a, a, to continue my example, a great founder in a big business in a very capital efficient industry, yes, that's actually worth more than the opposite. I, I agree. It's why I love like low competition markets. Like you said there about shipping, I, I love shipping too, because not many great entrepreneurs out of Stanford or Harvard or you name exactly. your great university go, oh, I'm going to innovate in shipping. They all go, I'm going to innovate in payments or in B2B. But like, or you know, we're dating, doing one dating sites or things like that. Or, yeah. <sighs> so the non sexy areas, we just invested in a company that is creating software to manage the food, the meals in a hospital. So there's a thousand different people in the hospital staying overnight. One has a peanut allergy, one is kosher, one is uh, low salt, one is pre diabetic. It's super complicated. You have to have a piece of software to manage that. There are very, very old systems. This is the sort of thing you and I would never think about. These entrepreneurs came in. They had created a much better product, starting to close hospital deals. It's a huge sector. Hospitals pay $150,000 for this software. And we're like, that's a great, good team, good market. Uh, no one thinks about it. That's really interesting. And in the US, you obviously have a lot more private hospitals. Yes. Because I, I, you need customers who have budget. In the yeah. UK, you'd sell to the NHS, which is the national. Oh, yeah. Sucks. We, you know, we don't do any healthcare outside the United States because the U.S. healthcare market is both enormous and terrible, which is what you want when you're an entrepreneur. Kevin, what's been your biggest miss and what did you learn? You know, the biggest miss is in, if I knew now what I knew then, I would have been much more aggressive early on in starting more companies, building up more of a team, because sometimes it takes five to seven years to know that things are going really well. If we had sat here, you know, six years ago, I'm an investor in this crazy company, uh, you know, in Argentina and this company called Zola, which I started, but who knows what's going to work. Turns out a lot of these worked and I would have actually doubled down that that was a golden age for the last decade. And so capital, I would have done better. Is that the benefit of hindsight though? Let me just push you there. you had done better and you would have actually done 10 more. Your attention would have been way more diversified and they may not have been as successful because you didn't have time for them. Could be, but you know, the reason Nally Corp works today is because of the team. And we have a 25 person team. We have multiple partners. That's really the business is getting, you know, our, our healthcare portfolio and I don't have a healthcare background, you know, is incredible. But, but what I really did, like I did at, you know, running double click or guilt is put together an amazing team uh, and they're doing great work. How do you think about reserves financing? You mentioned, hey, we put the million and a half in, they go out, they get venture. Uh, do you double down? Do you say, hey, no, no reserves signaling is dangerous? How do you think about concentration of capital? So we um, aren't that concentrated. So we continue to invest in our companies until probably a hundred or $200 million valuation. And depending on, uh, so we'll do a couple rounds. We generally don't put more than 10 million, might go to 15 million in any one company. And sometimes we'll leave some money on the table and, and other people will, will take it. We want the highest return investments. And that's why we've had, you know, very good results. Cause you know, when our companies are worth a billion, we're just not investing in them at that point. And sometimes that would have been a good idea, but you know, sometimes it's not. No, I totally get that. The other challenge that I find is selling and when to sell. What have been some big lessons for you in actually liquidity management and when to sell? Look, the biggest challenge in the last three years is that there is no liquidity. There are very few sales. 
But when you have an opportunity, you should take it. Um, but again, that that's company specific. Like, you know, we were never open to selling Mongo, no matter what, because we really thought we were building a 10 or $20 billion company. And so we had confidence. We had conviction. Uh, I sold Business Insider not because I wanted to, because we were doing $40 million in revenue and someone offered me $450 million for a media company. And so I said, yes. It was not an easy decision. It, it, it was. As I said, yeah, I say to, the, to my CEOs, if someone makes you an offer you can't refuse, don't refuse it. Uh, you know, take it. But, you know, I, I bought three years ago, I bought the company Meetup for $10 million because WeWork was getting rid of it and had panicked and COVID had just started. And, you know, I just I just sold it. It, it was announced in January. Uh, so sold it for seven or eight times that amount. Uh, so, you know, because there was a buyer who wanted to buy it and the company's making now a lot of money where it had lost $20 million the year before I bought what did you, sorry, I'm just fascinated on that one. So meet up, you buy for like 10. It was like a distress sale from like a distress seller at the time who just wanted to get rid. Did you do much to the asset or was it just a unique buying opportunity? So both. It was a unique buying opportunity. No one would touch the company because COVID had just started and you couldn't meet the CEO. And we weren't used to doing everything by Zoom at the back. Who buys a company when you can't meet the management team? No one. Except that the CEO... David Siegel, who's incredible, worked for me at DoubleClick 20 years before. So I knew him. And he had been reaching out to me, asking about the, the business in the six months before, just as a mentor. And finally, he said, God, they're panicking. I don't know. I think they're going to shut it down or give it away. And I said, wait a second. You know, why don't, why don't I buy it? So I got one or two other investors, bought it. Um, but we also went from 130 people the day I bought it to 90 people a week later, which is the right amount. Today it has probably 80, or when we sold it, it had 82 people. And it went from a $20 million loss on 32 million in revenue the, when we work owned it the year before to now we're making five or $6 million in profits. It's a great business. So David did a great job. Uh, team was good. We ran it well. That's not the normal thing we do. It was just a one-off situation. It was a brand I knew I'd known for 20 years. Uh, I was based in New York and I knew David. So it made sense. Can I ask you, we had some of those amazing successes. What's been your biggest loss? Which one's the one that was the most expensive and costly where you lost the most money? You know, it's more, it's not about losing so much money is that, you know, in, in 2000, I had probably a hundred million dollars worth of double kick stock on paper, which ended up being 10 million. We were a year and a half, a year away from going public at Gilt where Goldman Sachs said, Kevin, you've got about $165 million. We're feeling really good about this. And that ended up being uh, $10 million. So things evaporated along the way, even if they were paper gains, but you think that they're going to exist. And so that happens. Could you have sold them? No, no, the guilt I couldn't have. And I did sell all the shares I could uh, at, at DoubleClick mm -hmm. in 2000. So I... Couldn't have, but still, you know, it's it's disappointing when you see 90% of the company you're focused on, the, va the value evaporate. Uh, so yeah, things, but you know, at my week every day, we have 130 companies. Something's going wrong somewhere in the portfolio. You know, uh, I can think of another company that I thought I had a $50 million position. And right now my guess is I'm going to, you know, end up getting very little or getting my money back. But on the other hand, there, there are big gains. That's the game we play. Do you care about loss ratio? I mean, in the long term, you do, but it is what it is. It's. But the truth is, honestly, Kevin, like, if you only ever had Mongo, right. it wouldn't actually matter. Oh, no, I'm, I'm fine. I mean, I'm not. No, I'm no, fine. I, I know. I'm just saying, like, like, if the outliers are so disproportionately large, yes. if they really are, yes. nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. And so, you know, you should be doing this business because you love doing it. And you find it exciting. You love the mission. You like helping entrepreneurs. You like coming up with new ideas, creating new categories. That's what's fun about it. And then if you do it well, you're probably financially in, in our business going to do very well. But I don't think about that day to day. And we don't talk about that internally. We talk about we are building companies. If we build good companies, everything will work out fine financially. Doug Leone said recently to me that we have turned from a high boutique 
uh, high margin industry to a low margin commoditized industry. Do you agree with that transition statement? No. Um, <laughs> what, what is true is that when you are a late stage investor uh, writing $50 million checks, that you are what we used to call private equity. So you're competing on price. There's already an established board. You're not adding that much value. It's just a different world. You know, you know, it's changed so much. When Apple went public, when they went public, they raised $9 million in the IPO. And uh, so it's very different today. In the early stage business that Union Square Ventures does, that we do of, you know, the first check-in, um, that's not a commodity business. You have huge wins. You have some, you know, a bunch of losses. And by the way, I was on the board of Yale and on the board of the Yale Endowment. So we were the lead investor in many of the best firms. And as you know, in VC, there's a huge difference between returns that, let's say, a benchmark and a Greylock have and 90% of the rest of the uh, industry. 100%. My fear is that we, we've just seen like multi-stage firms commoditize seed so efficiently that everyone has a seed strategy. I'm always asked by LPs, like, which funds on the West Coast should we do? Because you meet everyone, Harry. And I'm like, honestly, Sequoia, Andreessen just come in and bid up every great round at seed. You might as well just be in Sequoia and Andreessen. No, we don't see in uh, the last, you know, 20 seed deals, uh, they're not in there very often. They don't, they're not, they don't have the coverage of the, you know, $2 million checks. And also a lot of entrepreneurs are very nervous about taking their money. On the West Coast, people just take their money regardless. But here, here's the risk. If a huge fund puts a million dollars into your initial round, and if they don't lead the next round, your company's dead. Whereas if a seed investor invests in your first round, it's understood that you're going to go out to someone else. But the negative signaling that occurs, and it's happened to me. I had a big, big, big firm uh, join in. Everyone was very excited. And then they lost faith, partly because the guy who invested in our company left the firm. And they're like, ah, we don't really, we're not really into it. We're going to pass. And then the company was dead. Dude, getting orphaned is the worst thing in a portfolio. I completely yeah. agree. But the 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 chat. So I'm with you one thousand percent. But I always get multi stage investors push back on me. Obviously, <laughs> everyone has to defend their corner. But they say, "Oh, rubbish, Harry. Every round gets preempted today." And of course, index does not call up Sequoia, who've done the pre seed or the seed, and say, "Oh, are you going to do the A?" And so the signaling doesn't exist because of the prominence of preemption rounds. There's, I, I think you're being misled by the 10 supposed hottest deals who get preempted. That's not where the industry is. The vast majority of things are not being preempted. They're going out, they're raising good rounds. Uh, they take a couple of years to be really, really big. That's the meat of the industry. I agree with you. Do you think venture is more competitive than it has ever been? Yes. Look, the, the reason one should be concerned about venture today is that... Um, there are there's probably four times as much money in funds today as there was in 2017. And the question is, are there four times as many opportunities? And I don't think there are. I think it's shifted. There's more opportunities in AI, but frankly, far fewer opportunities in e-commerce and media as we discussed. I think there's actually even fewer opportunities in straight enterprise software. Mm. You know, does Bank of America need new software products this year that they didn't buy last year? You know, they've already purchased a lot. So I think there's just a bubble of money. There's more money than the industry needs. And as we've discussed later, they'll spread it out. Uh, but and, 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 and unlike in the hedge fund industry, our money doesn't leave very easily. It takes a long time. It's sticky. Now, you'll see Tiger, which had a fund that was whatever, 100 and now is, is now 50. Um, so you'll see new funds being smaller, but that takes time to work through the system. Are you worried about the illiquidity? You know, I'm looking at M&A markets thinking, <laughs> I don't think IPO market is going to open in 24. I know we've just seen Rubrik go out, but I think it's one of few for sure. Um, are you worried about the illiquidity? And how do you think about that? Yeah, I do worry about it. And there's nothing any of us can do about it. It makes no sense to me that you, know, you just can't take a company public. Even though your numbers are seventy better than 70% of all publicly traded companies that are already public, 
And yet the banks and everyone were like, yeah, yeah, you can't go public. There's no opening for that. It's just closed. It would be as if the, you were selling your apartment in New York City and everyone's like, no, 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 sorry. No apartments are going to be sold for the next two years. Well, so I have so many VCs on the show who say like, oh, it's complete rubbish. How you can always take a company public. You just might have to change your perspective on the price that you're willing to go out at. Is that wrong? That is wrong. Um, if your company's growing at 60% and profitable, yes, you can always go public. But at the margin, it is not easy to take companies public. There's not a lot of appetite. Look, you know, many, many companies that'd be very happy to be public and they're not. And they're not because... They either can't do it or uh, somehow we just have not opened that up. For 15 years, I've wanted to solve this problem that we need a way for companies that are, you know, $100 million and growing at 20% to be able to go pop. And that doesn't exist. What are the main reasons why companies plateau? Because you see quite a lot of companies that kind of 40 to 60 million in revenue. And they're, ju- they're sitting on a billion, a billion and a half valuations. And you're looking at them going... <sighs> probably 500. What, what, um, why does that happen? And what do you think will happen to them? So one, if they've plateaued their growth, they're not worth 500. Um, you know, they're not at all. I mean, 10 times revenue for a company that's not growing that much is is not going to fly in today's market. That company's worth, you know, maybe 200 if they're starting to be quite profitable. Yeah, look, but that's normal. You should expect that out of every 100 companies that start, whatever, 20 go out of business after two years, a certain percentage get to 10, 20, 30 million, a smaller percentage get to 50, a smaller percentage get to 100. Uh, it just keeps funneling down. That's normal. Not every market is a trillion dollar market and not every product is going to get you know 30% of its market. Can I ask a final one before we do a quick fire? Yeah. It, you've mentioned you know, some incredible wins and you know accumulated personal wealth. I have a lot of founders on the show who talk about challenges with their relationship to money. How has your relationship to money changed over time? So actually, you know, surprisingly little. I don't focus it on that much. You know, five years ago, uh, my the only car I owned was a used minivan. Um, I'm not that into stuff. I am into experiences, so great travel, uh, things like that. I'm absolutely willing to spend money on. Uh, but uh, no, I mean, it's been a long time for me that I haven't had to worry about money, but I also just don't spend money to spend money. And so I don't have any problem with it all. I have no concern about the relationship with money. I, I, some people are so focused on money, which I'm not, that once they made money, they didn't know what to do. Whereas for me, that changed nothing. I enjoy what I'm doing. When people ask me, sometimes you know, I'm at a, college, a business school, they'll say, why are you still doing this? And my answer is, does anyone ask a really good NBA player who's 32, and who's made a ton of money. Why are you still playing basketball? Why don't you retire? Like no one would ask that question, right? Because he would say, yes, they do pay me a lot of money, but I love what I'm doing and I can't think of anything else I'd rather do. So I'm going to do it as long as I can. And then eventually it'll end and I'll do something else. And that's exactly how I feel. Final, final one before the quick fire. Has New York lived up to the hype? And what like Europe has, has not, if we're blunt, and I'm happy to admit that. And people say New York hasn't either. So Europe, so New York City has so outperformed the expectations, people have already forgotten it. So in 1996, the number one question I got running DoubleClick was, why aren't you in Boston? Boston is the tech center. You're giving me a perplexed look because you can't even remember that. I I was born in 96, Kevin. (laughs) I can't remember. (laughs) That, you know, Deck and Wang had been in Boston. And so it was known as the tech city. And when we went public, we couldn't even find a lawyer in New York City that had ever taken a company public. And so then, and I said this at the time, but if you had said, wait a second, Kevin, what do you think that if 25 years from now, is there a chance that there'll be more tech jobs in New York than in San Francisco? And that uh, we are now some quarters competing for the amount of money. You would have said, I'm sorry, that's impossible to imagine. And so New York has grown faster than any other city. It's still not, it still doesn't have as many big wins as San Francisco, but don't forget the big wins are from 15 years ago. So we talk about Mongo and Datadog, they started in 2007. So what we're trying to decide is right now, are more and more smart people starting companies in New York? Absolutely. Are there five times as many venture capital firms? We hardly had any VC money. 
but the, when I went out to raise money in Silicon Valley in 97, they said, we will not invest in you unless you move to San Francisco, which we weren't willing to do. Today, every one of those firms that turned me down for that reason has an office in New York City. So that's the trend line. So yeah, New York is killing it and will be the number one uh, company clearly uh, 15 years. What other $10 billion companies are there, but Datadog and Mongo? Uh, so Etsy is in the same category. And just give you some context, five years ago, there was not one publicly traded company in New York City startup that was worth more than three billion. Now we have two at 25 or 30, one at 10, more on the way. Uh, so these things take time. But yeah, I, mean, I, mean, I was just in the Google office. They have 15,000 people in New York City. And I remember 20 years ago, people saying, oh, but there are, there's no tech talent in New York. You can't, you can't start an enterprise software company here. But somehow they found 15,000 people. Do you worry about the centralization of AI talent in San Francisco? No, I think uh, San Francisco absolutely has an advantage in AI. It stems from the fact that, you know, I, I just started a company in material science AI. And, you know, the university that dominates that space is Berkeley. And so Berkeley and Stanford uh, are stronger than New York, than Columbia and NYU. And they've had companies and deep talent. So absolutely, San Francisco has an advantage in that area. But we're seeing, you know, 10 companies a week starting in New York. They're starting all over this country. Many of the smartest people are doing AI, and it will distribute more. What I always tell people when I'm traveling internationally, and they used to ask me, which cities are going to dominate in your country? It's no, there's, it has nothing to do with tax policy, has nothing to do with anything. I say, People who went to the top 20 universities in your country, where do they want to live? Where are they going to move? That's going to be your tech center. And guess what? That number one place, those places people want to move is New York City. San Francisco is still a great place and you know has, has history and uh, many things going for it. So it's an amazing, incredible place. But I'm not seeing the tech talent in Miami, and I don't think it's going to get there. Uh, I'm not seeing it in Chicago. Uh, I'm not seeing it in D.C., you know, don't forget, 15 years ago, the number one uh, internet company on the on the East Coast was AOL, based in DC. Is DC the tech hub that New York City is? Not at all. The super smart people from Harvard, Yale, Princeton, MIT, they want to live in New York City. I could talk to you all day, Kevin. Uh, I am mindful. <laughs> I am mindful of time. Um, so I want to move into a quick fire round. So I say a short statement, you give me your immediate thoughts. Does that sound yeah. okay? Sure. Slightly weird and out there one. What's the secret to a very happy marriage? You know, it's, it's, it, first of all, it's putting the time in and the commitment. I've been married for 32 years. Uh, it's, you know, it's friendship at the core and a common purpose of, you know, hopefully if you're doing it, raising kids. Uh, and we've been very lucky. Uh, I have three kids in our 20s. It's a big part of our lives. It's been amazing. How do you bring children up with such financial success, to be humble and also hardworking and ambitious. You know, you have to install that from day one and understand and treat them that way too. I was, you know, with friends of mine and they said, maybe I shouldn't have given my 18 year old a $75,000 Porsche. And I'm like, yeah, of course you shouldn't. You know, my kids don't have any of that. They graduate from college. They, they have to make it on their own. They have, they hopefully go to good schools. They, that you're installing that from day one. <laughs> yeah, that Lamborghini was not, not a good thing. Yeah. Uh, that, tell me, what have you changed your mind on most in the last 12 months? You know, I thought there was going to be more of a recession. Um, other than that, you know, my, my opinions don't change dramatically because I really have to have this 10-year perspective, as I was saying earlier. So it doesn't change day to day, my industry focus, things like that. In the last... You know, five years, I've become much more interested in healthcare. That's one big thing. Why do you think there will not be such a big recession that you thought would happen? The combination of the stimul the fiscal stimulus, what the Biden administration has done, which doesn't get credit for, uh, combined with the Federal Reserve, has been remarkable management. You know, I read the French press and they talk about Bidenomics and how do we compete with this because you can be with it because it's so effective. And our French companies are setting up factories in the United States and creating jobs. So I think it's been remarkable management between those two. No one, th there's not a single economist that thought this was going to happen. Will Trump win? Um, look, it's good. Either way, it's going to be 50-50. I think Biden's going to win. But, you know, it's, 
it's actually going to end up being out of our hands. You know, if either one of them has a huge health issue, that could do it. If there's a, um, <laughs> if there is a uh, something happening from a geopolitical point of view that goes horribly wrong, that could change it. Um, I think that the s- substance and the success of the economy at the end of the day, uh, combined with the fact that the Democrats are winning every single election that is occurring across this country and outperforming since the Roe v. Wade uh, decisions means that at the margin, the Democrats are going to win. What's the biggest piece of startup advice that you think's most BS? Like the most commonly said that you're like, oh, I can't believe this is still a trope. I don't know if I have a good one there. I mean, I, my general question to most startup advice is it depends. You know, there's some companies that should spend more money. There's some companies that don't have product market fit. They should slow down. Obviously, you should hire good people, but, you know, everyone's trying to do that. You know, move fast. Yes. But if your product sucks, that's not good. So, you know, startups and business are a series of decisions and compromises that are situation specific. And so it's each, it, it, that's where judgment is important. And that's where I do think investors and good CEOs play the role. What's the luckiest thing that's ever happened to you? Oh, by far, it was, I mean, financially, it was working with two other co-founders and starting Mongo. But was and, that, is that luck though? Well, look, I had, it was my CTO. I was the CEO of, of DoubleClick and the CTO and I uh, wanted to start, we started companies together. We had started one or two that didn't work. And then we started Mongo. But the intellectual and execution of Mongo came more from them than from me. I mean, they built the product. I think I, I benefited even more than I deserve to. Um, you know, making the decision to get involved with the internet in 96, which, you know, I thought was going to do well, but, you know, I, I've had other thoughts over time that I thought were going to do well and they didn't. And that changed my life and my career. What do you know now that you wish you'd known the day you started investing? The judgment of seeing many things work and not work um, is help. It makes you more decisive on just feeling like, you know, I'm just not feeling it and trusting probably my gut feel a little bit more. If it just doesn't feel right, it doesn't feel right. Penultimate one. What are you most concerned about in the world today? Trump. For me, the single thing I'm worried about, I'm actually, you know, the the, the world from a safety and security point of view is is actually okay. I'm obviously very biased on this, uh, but the single thing that I'm concerned about is Trump winning on multiple dimensions, giving away uh, Ukraine, uh, you know, Supreme Court justices, Poor, very, very, very poor execution of every aspect of government, uh, a level of corruption that I think would follow. So that's the single thing that worries me the most. I think the thing that worries me the most is we've seen the normalization of corruption across so much of government while we're almost not surprised anymore. So I don't agree. I don't think there's a single example in the cabinet of Biden after four years that you can point to where we could point and say, I think that's actual corruption. I, I suggest you look at the UK government. Uh, okay, that's. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not commenting no, on the no, UK. No, I, I, you're, you're absolutely right with the Biden administration. In the UK, we've had some very interesting decisions made on a lot that, of different. Oh, that's a whole other conversation uh, that we should talk about. But you know, frankly, the uh, uh, from a corruption point of view, with the benefit of hindsight, I you know the Obama administration was extremely clean. And the Biden administration has been extremely clean. I'm not saying that they all did everything right in their policies. But from a corruption point of view, I don't uh, argue that either White House had a problem. Final one for you, Kevin. Uh, When you think about the 10 to 20 year time horizon for you and for the funds now, what does that look like? The business we're in does not scale infinitely. We're not trying to accumulate assets. So I don't want to be a $2 billion fund. Um, I want to continue doing what we're doing. We may uh, go bigger in some areas. Like we have a deep tech practice. I would like that to get bigger over the next couple of years. So next time we raise a fund, if we could, you know, I might I might increase the size a little bit just to increase verticals. But we're going to continue doing what we're doing. And look, I I lead my life because I want to be enjoying it, having fun, you know, doing athletic pursuits, going to Burning Man. Uh, making great investments, helping entrepreneurs, spending a lot of time with my kids, you know, out there having fun. 
Listen, Kevin, I've loved this. Thank you so much for, for doing it. Thank you so much for sharing so many of the lessons learned and you've been fantastic. Yeah, it was great to do this. It was a great conversation.